Hi, this is Alistair Groves. Just a reminder that we're taking a longer break from the podcast this fall, but we have a plan to return with a new format and more frequent episodes in 2025. In the meantime, we'll be sharing some previously released resources with you. Today's episode is a session from our national conference a few years ago. Uh, the session is by Mike Emlett, and it's titled Beyond Devotional Doldrums, Using Scripture and Prayer to Foster Intimacy with God. In the talk, Mike discusses some practices to faithfully and creatively engage in scripture reading and prayer, which are two means God has provided for believers to regularly draw near to him and to strengthen our faith. It was my first year in college. I was a fairly new Christian and was part of a campus fellowship that put a high priority on the daily quiet time. So I wanted to have this regular time in the Word and in prayer, but I didn't want to make my non-Christian roommate uncomfortable as I sat at my desk in our, in our tiny room and prayed. And I'm, I'm sure I was self-conscious and experienced some, some fear of man. Uh, but what I decided to do was use the, the large walk-in closet in our, uh, in our room as a private space. So I announced to him uh, one morning, I'm going into the closet to have my devotions. As if that were less uncomfortable than me sitting at my desk with my head bowed. I know, super, super weird. In fact, uh, later that year, after my roommate had come to Christ and had gotten involved in the same campus fellowship, uh, he admitted to me, you know, I misheard you uh, that day. I thought you said you were going into the closet to have your diversions. And I was like, okay, whatever. Well, <laughs> thankfully, as uh, the Puritan Thomas Watson uh, says or said, uh, God is pleased to strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. And so my roommate did not run to campus housing to request a new and more sane roommate uh, when I originally had commandeered uh, our closet. But I'm, I'm, stuck, I'm struck afresh by the, the oddness of these practices by anyone who's not a Christian. We actually believe that the Bible is not like any other book we might read. Uh, we actually believe that the scripture is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12. We actually believe that when we call out to God aloud or from our hearts, he actually hears us, that true communication is happening. Why? Because God has declared it to be so, that his word and prayer are actually his designated means of grace, used by the Holy Spirit to draw us into deeper communion, deeper intimacy with himself. J.C. Ryle puts it like this, these are appointed channels through which the Holy Spirit conveys fresh supplies of grace to the soul and strengthens the work which he has begun in the inward man. And yet, if we're honest, many of us struggle to have consistent time reading scripture and praying, to partake regularly of the incredible privilege of listening to God and, and speaking to God. Now, there are many reasons for that, of course, and, and I'm not going to speak today of the barriers uh, that we face in meeting with God regularly, but suffice it to say that in the press of day-to-day -day life, perhaps even now more disrupted uh, by the pandemic, particularly if you have younger children at home, time in the Word and in prayer is important but not urgent, to use the, the phrasing of, of Charles Hummel. In other words, the world will not end if I, if I don't engage in scripture reading or, or prayer today. And yet, over time, we suffer loss in the same way that we suffer the stagnation of intimacy in human relationships when we don't prioritize time together. And so here's, here's my hope, that you will come away strengthened 
and motivated in your commitment to the practice of prayer and engagement with scripture as pathways for intimacy with God, and we'll be equipped with several specific ways to engage these practices. Ultimately, I hope you will come away resonating with Jeremiah 15, 16. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. So let me pray as we, as we dig in. Father God, we would pray that this, uh, this attitude of Jeremiah would be our own, that, your, that spending time with you would be, uh, would be delightful, and that you would be pleased to manifest more of yourself during these times, and even in this hour that we meet. In the name of Christ, amen. I have a, an outline, of course, attached uh, to, to this video, so please feel free to, to follow along. Where I'm going to start is with three misconceptions about our devotional lives. And here's the first one, that personal discipline and dependence on God are incompatible. In fact, they're, they're both critical for our devotional lives. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me, toward me, was not in vain, or in the NIV, it was not without effect. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, that is, the other apostles, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Right? You see that, you see that balance. Now, how does that relate to our devotional lives. David Mathis says this, our devotional practices are in response to grace, empowered by grace, and sustained by grace. All our exertions are gifts of grace. And at the same time, Mathis titles his book, Habits of Grace, to, to highlight the importance of committing to those practices on a regular basis. So consider your devotional times to be the equivalent of digging irrigation ditches uh, in the field of your heart, trusting and relying on the Lord to bring his living water to, to fill those ditches. I think that's especially important if you're, if you're finding your devotional times dry or it feels like at this season, scripture and prayer feel relatively uh, lifeless or very hard to engage with. That's what I had in mind when I used the term doldrums uh, in the title. It's a, it's a listlessness or lack of energy. But the doldrums is also an oceanography or a, a sailing term. Uh, the doldrums are the areas where the, the northeast and southeast trade winds converge at the equator. It's, it's an area where there's, uh, there's not much wind. Well, I've done just enough sailing to know that having wind is pretty important uh, to, to go from one place to another. At the same time, a seasoned sailor knows how to, how to set the, the sails and how to use the rudder in order to pick up on any wisp of a breeze. There's skill and discipline involved and a dependence on God to provide the wind. The same is true with, with our devotional lives. A second misconception, personal, individual devotional practices are more important than corporate worship for growth in the Christian life, or vice versa. Early in my Christian life, uh, discipleship was weighted towards the individual practices of piety. I went to church because I knew it was right and good uh, to do that. That was, you know, the Lord saying, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And so that was, that was the right thing to do. But I didn't experience it as a place of significant spiritual formation. But others would argue that the weekly gathering of the church for worship is where spiritual growth happens. That's where the action is. After all, this is the only place where the word is preached, corporate prayers are offered, uh, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are administered, along with the fellowship, experiencing the fellowship of, of God's people. But this is a false dichotomy. Uh, Luke Stamps notes this, we need not choose between personal piety and a strong emphasis on the gathered church. If we're diligent in the latter, then we will be strengthened in the former. And I would say that 
that works both ways. So let's agree together that both individual and corporate practices are important for a growing intimacy with God. And then the third misconception. There is a single key that unlocks and unleashes these means of grace. Now, we would probably never say that, of course, uh, but if our devotional times feel kind of dry or, or ho-hum, often we look for the next new thing, something to, to spice it up, a, a tried and true method that this time, this time will be the devotional silver bullet. But in fact, the issue is, is less about methodology and more about having an expectant and, and humble posture uh, before the Lord, showing up day after day, week after week, week to meet with God. That was driven home to me during a pottery workshop I attended several years ago. Uh, during, a during a demonstration, a participant asked uh, the instructor who was a well-known potter, how do you throw so many pots in a single day? You seem so productive and efficient. What's your secret? And he answered, I just keep my bottom in my seat and keep making pots, right? You might call that the, the bits principle, bottom in the seat, okay? That, in other words, the secret for his productivity as a potter was, was very simple. Show up and make pots day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Similarly, with our devotions, do we simply show up uh, expectant, uh, rooted uh, to our seat or our knees or our feet for any length of time? See, in a world of distractions, that's, that's really hard to do. So, there are no silver bullets, uh, just as developing intimacy in human relationships requires time and personal investment, the same is true in our, in our relationship with God. Um, that said, we ought to learn from one another and from our ancestors in the faith in terms of what are some specific ways that, that do uh, help our devotional lives, do help to make them profitable. So that's where I'll where I'm going to go now for the remainder of our time, I want us to talk about three practices. Um, if, I, if I polled all of you who are listening right now in terms of what uh, practices and resources you found most helpful in your devotional lives, well, we'd have a huge, we've had a huge, we would have a huge list. But I'm going to focus on three practices and some resources that I have found helpful personally, uh, knowing that there's much more that can be said. But I would say that having a plan is really important. Aimlessness begets aimlessness in the midst of our devotional lives. So the first practice I, I want to key in on is prayerful meditation on Scripture. And I, uh, I put this in the, the resources for you that two years ago, Steve Midgley did a, a breakout session specifically on meditation, on Scripture, and I'd commend that to you. And then recently, he expanded that into a Journal of Biblical Counseling article, which I also uh, showed in the, in the resources. So both of those are wonderful uh, expansions of what I'm going to say. But let's start here. What is, what is meditation? Uh, Thomas Watson, who I quoted earlier, said this, it's a holy exercise of the mind whereby we bring the truths of God to remembrance and do seriously ponder upon them and apply them to ourselves. Or to use a phrase from writer Marilyn McIntyre, it's learning to pause where scripture gives you pause. Learning to pause where scripture gives you pause. And so it's a slow prayerful reading that is geared toward a, a vital and lively connection between the scriptures and the particulars of our lives. How many times have you read scripture, perhaps in the morning uh, before your day started, found your interest, peaked in the moment, and then two hours later just didn't remember anything that you read uh, earlier in the day, let alone have it connect deeply in any way with your, with your life in that particular day. Well, meditation is the, is the bridge between reading and prayerful life transformation. Now, where do we see this in Scripture? Well, Psalm 1 speaks of the blessedness of the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord and, and who meditates on God's law day and night. 
or Psalm 119, uh, verse 11, uh, says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In a, in a similar way, God says to Joshua as, as, the, as the people, as he's ready to lead the people into the promised land, um, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Joshua 1.8. So in meditation, we're seeking to maximize the, the nourishment of God's word. I mean, by analogy, consider how we, we eat our food. I mean, we don't simply taste it and then spit it out, unless it's lima beans, um, nor do we generally shove it in our mouth and swallow it without, without tasting and, and chewing, right? In either case, we are, we are missing out on the full nutritional value of the food. We get our best nourishment from food when we, when we savor the taste, when we chew slowly, and when we swallow. And that's what we're doing in meditation. We're seeking to chew and digest God's word over time in order to be nourished in a way that our, that our very affections, our loves, our, our desires are shaped and reshaped. We're seeking nothing less in meditation than the transformation of our, of our thoughts, our affections, and our, our will, our actions. Now, how do we do it? How do we meditate? And I want us to, I want us to practice uh, using Psalm 57 verses 1 and 2, which I read and lingered on several, uh, several weeks ago. So feel, feel free to, to pause the video at, at each of these steps and, and do it yourself, try it yourself. Or if later you want to meditate on another passage of Scripture that, uh, that you recently read, that would be great. So here we go. The first step, I think, is to, is to notice the state of your heart as you begin. Are you, are you anxious? Are you sad? Are you thankful? Are you discouraged? Um, are you angry? Are you focused on a, a meeting that you have later in the day? Or are you thinking to a conversation you had the night before and you find yourself distracted? Where, where are you at as you, as you sit down to meet with God? Because noticing how you're coming to the task of meditation primes you to receive and hear a relevant word from the Lord. On that uh, particular day, when I read Psalm 57, there was a, there was a low-level dread and anxiety uh, that I felt that was centered on the, the pandemic uh, and more specifically related to a certain member of my family, uh, wondering if this particular family member was being careful enough with, with social distancing and mask wearing. Uh, both uh, my wife and I, particularly my wife, are in a higher risk category. So that's the, that's the first step. Assess where you're at as you, as you start the process. Secondly, pray for God's spirit to enliven and direct your reading. See, meditation is not a, an academic, cognitive uh, exercise. We are, we are dependent on God's spirit. We say with the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. So we pray for that to happen. Thirdly, read through the passage slowly, several times. Um, I think it's also helpful to read it aloud. Um, and so let's Let's do that. This is Psalm 57, uh, verses 1 and 2. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Okay, so that's the third step in meditation. Fourthly, notice what phrase or phrases capture your attention. For me, it was in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge. And this is one of the beauties of God's word, because I remember the last time I read Psalm 57, uh, what stood out was, I cry out to God who fulfills his purpose for me. But this time it was the idea of, of refuge, Okay, so notice what, what stands out. And then the fifth step, dialogue 
uh, with the text. Ask questions, probe, ponder. Um, what? What is a refuge, right? Um, it's, it's a shelter. It's, it's a protection from, uh, from distress or danger or harm. It's a place of safe haven or a rest. It's a sanctuary. Um, but how? How is God my refuge? Well, the preceding stanza says, in you, uh, this is earlier in verse one, in you my soul takes refuge. But if I'm honest, that that feels a bit general when I read that. It, uh, it's very easy to pass right over that. How, how exactly does that work? How is God my refuge? Well, it's as though the psalmist, David, is answering my question by adding, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge. And here's where paying attention to, to metaphor in scripture is so, is so helpful. This is, this is highly personal and full of visual imagery, right? A, a mother bird covering her chicks with her wing. You can't get any closer than that, right? You, you feel the, the body heat. You, you hear her, her heartbeat. You're safe from, from danger. At that point, my mind starts going elsewhere in Scripture, sometimes by using the, the cross-references that are associated with that particular place uh, in, in Scripture. And so Psalm 91, 1 and 2 comes to mind. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then start thinking, well, Jesus' lament over, over Jerusalem in Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing? Jesus is willing. He's, he's wanting to gather his people under his protective care. The word shadow reminded me of Psalm 121, 5 and 6. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Okay, another angle on the Lord as, as refuge. He is, my, he is my keeper. Then you started thinking, okay, exactly what dangers do I face? What, what is it that I need refuge from? And I, you know, I most often think of the, the temporal situational dangers, whether they be COVID-19 or other illnesses or financial insecurity or pressing deadlines or whatever myriad number of particular threats that I or you may face on a, on a given day. But as I, as I thought further that, that morning prayerfully, I realized there's an even greater danger uh, that, that I need refuge from. And that's from the consequence of my own sins. I, first and foremost, I need shelter from the wrath of God for my, for my sins. And Jesus, then, is my ultimate refuge. I am, I am safe in him. He is, he is my ultimate Passover lamb whose blood was shed on my behalf and was, was plastered over the doorframe of my soul. Nothing, nothing in all creation can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But clearly we do face temporal dangers and challenges. In fact, this psalm arose in the context of David fleeing from Saul. So it's right and good to cry out for help and rescue in a, in a world full of trouble. There are real life threats, right? Hurricanes do come and do demolish towns. Loved ones die from cancer. Houses burn down. Divorces occur. What we dread sometimes befalls us. So how, how should I understand God as refuge in those situations? I, I was wrestling with that question that morning. Yes, I have eternal security and refuge in Jesus, but how how does that intersect my life right now? Well, now I find refuge in my father's wise and loving providence. That's 
That's what, that's what came to mind. And, and that sent me to the Heidelberg Catechism, <laughs> of all places. Uh, question and answer 27, it says this. How do you understand, or what do you understand, by the providence of God? And the answer is this. The almighty and ever-present power of God, by which God upholds as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them, that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. He never, ever drops the fine china of my life or your life. We always remain in his hands. He's always ruling our lives with careful love, wisdom, and power. Always he is an ever-present refuge in the worst of life's storms. And in the end, he will bring us to himself in glory. So do you see the, the trajectory of, of meditation there? I, you know, went from refuge to shelter to wings to highly personalized protection to providence. All were directions that, that my meditation took me. And as profitable as that, as that was, that is not yet the end point of, of meditation. You've dialogued with the text, but now, sixthly, dialogue with your heart. And here I want us to consider this main question. How do these precious realities meet me right now? That's the question we want to ask at this part, at this stage of meditation. How do they intersect with my real life? And this is why starting the process of meditation by assessing the state of our hearts is so important. How do these realities, in my case, speak? Uh, how did they speak to the dread and anxiety that I was experiencing that, that morning? And what I sense the Lord asking was, where is your functional refuge, Mike? Where is it? Um, and as I pondered, I realized how much of the time I was functioning as my own place of refuge. Safety was up to me. And so, yeah, I was becoming more and more controlling of my environment in order to achieve that safety. The stakes were high. So no wonder I felt overwhelmed. I sensed him saying, Come in, out of the, out of the storm. Your, your small umbrella has been turned inside out by the wind and the rain. Let me shelter you. I'm, I'm willing and able and I love you. That's, that's the sense that I got that morning. And so the question for me that morning was, am I willing to come under his wings? Can I trust his protection and providence. He is a wise and loving refuge, not, not simply an impersonal bunker where I kind of wait out the, the storm, but a living, breathing refuge. And that leads then to the last step uh, in meditation, the seventh step, which is pivoting to, to prayer. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't and won't be praying throughout these earlier steps. I I certainly was, and, and you will as well. But I think having prayer as a final step in the meditation process reminds us that once again, meditation is not simply a cognitive you know, exercise, but a battle for God's word to stir my affections and direct my actions. And so I repented of the ways uh, in which I had been seeking to be my own refuge, including some of the over-controlling behavior, helicopter parenting that I was doing of my uh, young adult children who did not really appreciate that. Um, I thanked God that nothing, nothing can ultimately separate me from his love. I thanked him for his personal protective care uh, in my life. And I prayed for wisdom to know what I should take responsibility for and what I can take responsibility for and what I should just entrust uh, to him. And then ending with, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. And if I had had more time, I might have sung the hymn, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul, but 
I didn't that day, but that also would be something that would be a, an appropriate ending. What is our ultimate aim in meditation? Uh, we aim for our hearts uh, to, be, to be warmed and our desires and loves reoriented so that actual change, I go out into my day in a different way as a result. So that's the first practice, prayerful meditation on scripture. Here's a second practice, and I'll spend much less time on this one. Um, the Ignatian prayer of examine. This prayer originated with Ignatius of Loyola in the 1500s. Uh, the goal of the examine is to prayerfully review your day, uh, mindful of God's presence with you and noticing at various points in the day when you were drawn to him or points in the day when you moved away from him. Consider it a, a prayerful self-assessment at the end of your day. And the examine consists of several parts. So first, simply asking for God's perspective on the last 24 hours. And just as I talked about with meditation, this is not something that uh, is just purely academic, uh, you know, self-oriented exercise. I'm dependent on the Lord to reveal these things. So we ask for his perspective. Secondly, giving thanks. Um, Ignatius uh, considered ingratitude to be a grave sin. And so he says, I will ponder with great affection how much God our Lord has done for me and how much he has given me what he possesses. And finally, how much the same Lord desires to give himself to me. Which, which uh, reminds me of Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's, our, that's the starting posture of the exam and a thankfulness. And then the third piece is actually reviewing your day. And this falls into two categories, consolations and disconsolations. The consolations, where... Where did I notice today the love and kindness of God? Where was I especially at peace? When was I conscious of keeping in step with the Spirit? At what points of the day were, were faith, hope, and love, and other fruits of the Spirit evident? At that point in the exam, you thank God for the many particular ways in which His grace and mercy were evident to you throughout the day. Those are the consolations. But then the disconsolations, that's the, that's the opposite experience. When, in fact, did God feel far away? When was my heart not inclined toward him? Uh, when, where was I tempted and gave in to, into sin? Where was there anxiety or restlessness or, or carelessness present? Um, where were doubts and griefs weighing me down? At that point in the exam, and you, you come to God as a, as a sufferer and sinner. You lament before him, him, taking the griefs of your day to him, and you also own your sins, confessing them to God and receiving his forgiveness through Christ. That's the third step. And then the last step in the exam is simply asking God for his help as you face the blessings and challenges of the day ahead. Now, why have I found the exam helpful? Well, if I can put it this way, it serves as both a period and a comma uh, for my life. A, a period in that it encourages me to end the day uh, with, uh, with the Lord. And a comma in the sense that it looks forward to the next day, to this continued journey with God. And so as I go to sleep, I'm, I'm more mindful um, that God is with me. Yeah, that's the prayer of examine. And now a third practice, using resources that are prepared ahead of time or prepared by others. And I'm going to focus on two, devotional aids and pre-written prayers. Um, devotional aids, two of them here, uh, very briefly. Uh, scripture Union's Encounter with God. I first learned of this uh, devotional from David Pallison. And I would say, although I'm not currently using it, um, it is one of the few daily devotionals that I've stuck with for any, any length of time. And I think it's, it speaks to the quality of the, of the devotional. It comes out as a quarterly booklet, or it can be read online. Um, each day, there's a, there's a scripture reading associated with 
a thoughtful reflection that really uh, pays attention to the details of the text and then orient you with application questions and, and prayer. Um, and if you use it sequentially, you read through the whole Bible every, uh, every four years. So a great resource. A second resource uh, that I've used is called Seeking God's Face, Praying the Bible Through the Year by Philip Reinders. This is really, a, uh, you might call it a modified form of the, the daily office or daily prayers from the Book of Common Prayer. And each day includes the, the following elements. There's, a, there's an invitation to, uh, to meet with God. Usually it's a verse uh, from a psalm that, that kind of orients you. Uh, there, is, there is a time of silence, which is very hard to practice, right? It's, it's very, I've found it's very easy for me to go to one of two ways, right? I'm, I'm so distracted that I can't be silent, or I'm so tired that I actually become very silent. That is, I fall asleep. So practicing silence is challenging, and this resource encourages you to do it for a bit. Um, so there's, uh, there's a time of silence. There's a psalm to pray. Uh, then there's a, there's a reading from Scripture associated with uh, with prayerful meditation, and then it ends with both free, that is extemporaneous prayer, and, uh, and set prayer. One of the things I like about this resource is that it follows the, the church calendar, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, uh, Easter, Pentecost, ordinary time. It reminds me, it reminds me that the rhythms of my life should be less structured by my culture, right, New Year's, uh, July 4th, uh, Labor Day, the, the start of the academic year, the start of the school year, Halloween, et cetera, et cetera. It, rather than structuring my life around those rhythms, it encourages me to structure it around the story of redemption. So two, two resources, two devotional ways that I found helpful. Now I want to move to talk about prepared Prayers, And this is really a subset of the former. And before I get into this practice, I want to uh, deal with a concern that you might have. And that is, aren't spontaneous prayers more authentic than using words prepared by someone else? In other words, isn't improv better than, than a script? And I would say, not necessarily. Uh, and, here's, and here's why. First of all, we see this practice in Scripture. We pray the Psalms, which are pre-written prayer songs. God, in fact, gives us words that he, that he wants us to use. And in Luke 11, when the disciples approached Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray, Jesus taught his disciples to pray using a specific form with specific words. The Apostle Paul wrote out many of his prayers for the churches that he, uh, that he was corresponding with and included them in his, in his epistles. Although he doesn't command pray like this, clearly the fact that such prayers are included in God's word means that they, like every other part of scripture, is useful for training in righteousness, as, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says. Second, we use prepared resources all the time in corporate worship, whether there are songs and hymns, um, responsive readings, the, the Apostles' Creed, uh, set formats for baptism, the Lord's Supper, and receiving new members. Um, we use pre-prepared uh, forms all the time. Thirdly, and I think this is actually what is most important for me, Prepared prayers can disciple our hearts into more robust, God-glorifying, kingdom-centered praying. Uh, these prayers, in other words, help shape belief and practice. If I'm honest, the echo chamber of my, uh, of my own mind doesn't always lead to God-centered, uh, Christ-exalting, spirit-dependent prayer for the life of the world using set prayers, at least periodically, not arguing for them all the time, but using them at least periodically prompts me to, to adoration and confession and thanksgiving and supplication that, that extend beyond my own interests and priorities. Musician uh, Andrew Peterson, reflecting on John Bailey's A Diary of Private Prayer, says this, 
The point is, Bailey's words lead me gently but firmly into prayers I would not have otherwise thought to pray. In them, I'm confronted by my own darkness, not just of of obvious sins, but of the sins that lurk beneath them, as well as the light of God's mercy. As the revenant of that Scottish saint takes me by the hand and leads me through the thorny hedges of godly shame and repentance into the wide golden fields of gratitude for God's mercy in Christ. And so using set prayers helps me stay God-focused and serves as a, as a guide and, and tutor for my, for my spontaneous prayers. Fourth, using pre-written prayers, particularly from believers over the centuries, reminds me that I'm part of an ever-flowing stream of, of Christians offering their prayers to God. So when I pray the confession of sin from the, the Book of Common Prayer each morning, not only am I praying the same way that Christians have prayed over the centuries, I am joining my heart with the hearts of millions of Christians across the world who are praying that particular prayer today. Now, those are four reasons uh, why I think using prepared prayers can be helpful. No doubt using prepared prayers can become a rote exercise, um, but it doesn't have to be the case. We uh, can become just as rote, in a sense, with our spontaneous uh, prayers that day after day stay within the same narrow channels of, of thought and expression. Now, of course, thankfully, God never gets bored with, uh, with the prayers of his, of his children. So no matter, no matter what, uh, whether it's extemporaneous praying or using set forms, he is pleased uh, to hear us. And he is patient with our growing pains as we learn to pray. I want to mention uh, two resources that I found helpful for pre-written prayers. And I want to focus first on the Book of Common Prayer Collects. Okay, I've been using the Anglican Church in North America's uh, recently published Book of Common Prayer. Now, what is a collect? Okay, it's a short, fixed prayer that is meant to gather up or collect the individual petitions of members of the congregation um, into one prayer. Okay, into one prayer. And it generally has five parts. Okay, so first there's the address right? Uh, who, am I, who am I speaking to? Um, the Lord. The acknowledgement, that is acknowledging some quality of God related to the petition that, that will follow, okay? Thirdly, the petition itself. What are we actually asking of God? Fourthly, the aspiration. Why are we asking? What do we want to see happen as a result of praying? And then, and then fifthly, the, the invocation or actually pleading through Jesus' name. So let me give a couple examples of this. So here's the, here's the collect for, for purity. Okay, so here's the address. Almighty God, the acknowledgement. Unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Here's the petition. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit. Okay, here's the aspiration that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify thy holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, that's the collect for purity. Here's another one, the collect for the fifth Sunday in Lent, which is one of my, one of my favorites. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, why why do I like the colics? Well, they're really... God-centered. In fact, they're, they're invariably Trinitarian. Um, they're short, but they are dense theologically and experientially. I like how they base a petition on some aspect of God's character or, or work. In that sense, 
when we're praying, they're not standalone petitions, but they're always clothed with the aroma of, of biblical truth and God's character. And then the form of a colic has helped me to pray extemporaneously. Uh, for example, I was thinking, how might I, how might I pray Psalm 57, uh, 1 and 2, in the, form, in the form of a collect? Well, my heavenly shepherd and my most high God, you shelter and protect me as carefully as a mother bird does her babies. Please help me to to look to your care with increasing confidence so that the anxiety that I face this morning may, may diminish as I see your care. Do this, I ask, for the sake of Jesus Christ, my Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So they shape, they can shape my, my extemporaneous prayers. So those are collects. And let me mention now a resource called Every Moment Holy. This is a contemporary resource that I've just begun to use over the last year. It's a, it's a book, uh, it's a collection of prayers and liturgies written by Douglas McKelvey, meant to be used in multiple everyday settings. Um, this, this book is not only a, a feast for the ears, but it is also a feast for the eyes because it contains beautiful uh, woodcut prints from artist uh, Ned Bustard. What I love about this book is that it prompts prayer in many settings where I might not be motivated to pray. For example, um, there is a liturgy, a prayer for changing diapers uh, that ends with this. Let me not be frustrated by the constant repetition of this necessary act on behalf of this child. Rather, let the, the daily doing of this be a reminder to me of the constant cleansing and covering of my own sin that I, helpless as this baby and more often in need, actually enjoy in the active mercies of Christ. Amen. Or a liturgy for waiting in line. Okay, I don't know about you, but that's usually not a place that is a, uh, a fruitful time of prayer, right? Usually I'm scoping out the other lines, which one is moving faster. I jump lines only to see, of course, the line that I was originally in is actually moving faster. So yes, usually I'm experiencing frustration and not prayerfulness, but, but a prayer like this reminds me, this is actually an opportunity to engage with God. So it begins, as my life is lived in anticipation of the redemption of all things, so let my slow movement in this line be to my own heart a living parable and a teachable moment. Do not waste even my petty irritations, O Lord. Use them to expose my sin and selfishness and to reshape my vision and my desire into better, holier things. Now that's waiting in line uh, the way it should happen. And if I counted correctly, there are 105 other prayers like that to use throughout our days, uh, many for the seemingly most mundane of moments. But the prayers and liturgies of that resource remind me to be attuned to all of those moments I'm experiencing and, and to use them as an opportunity to turn toward God, hence the title, Every Moment Holy. It embodies Paul's admonition in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. I want to conclude with this. Um, this conference is about the incredible reality that, that God has drawn near to us and invites us to draw near to him. The devotional practices and resources I've talked about are simply means to that glorious end. But again, I'd encourage you, be less concerned about methodology and, and tools and more concerned about simply showing up with a humble and expectant heart and the scriptures in your hands. Not every devotional time will feel like a mountaintop experience. In fact, most will not. But that's true in our human relationships as well, isn't it? Small, faithful, daily engagements with a friend or a roommate or a spouse are the building blocks of intimacy. Even though any one encounter may seem very unremarkable. 
But as Paul says in Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And so may the prayer of David recorded in Psalm 27, verses 7 and 9, be our desire and hope. Let's, let's pray this together. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Amen.